Thank you for joining us today. As you may already know, especially if you've joined us for last month's webinar, a significant aspect of the humaculture philosophy is feed the soil, not the plant. The most successfully sustained organizations are those focused, whether intentionally or not, on cultivating an enriching workplace where people thrive. Those focused on people, either paying the highest wages or attempting to compete with having the richest or latest fad and benefits, often encounter extremely difficult stretches when they suddenly realize they must refocus their attention on the bottom line. In fact, it's easy for organizations to be reactive and become distracted by all sorts of things that seem to be the most important at any given moment. Today's presentation helps organizations identify ways to stay focused in spite of or perhaps because of things that might otherwise be distractions or impediments on the path to success. We believe the best responses to the No Surprises Act or any compliance initiative is through an approach that combines strategy and compliance. This approach will also help improve the perceived and actual value of your organization's health coverage, contributing to the fertile soil you seek to cultivate. Let me introduce our speakers for today's session. I'm Steve Saborn. I'm an actuary and have over three decades of experience in HR benefits and total rewards. I've conducted research and taken a behavioral approach to all reward programs. Wes, Wes Rogers is our humiculturist. He understands the humiculture aspects of rewards and applies the research and case studies from my past to conceptualize the organization uh, within the horticulture metaphor. Jack is our strategy and compliance consultant. He's a lawyer with decades of experience. He's a pioneer of several benefit innovations and has frequently testified in front of Congress and their committees around various HR and benefit issues. Kelly Long is an accountant, financial well being planner, coach, and consultant. She has worked for financial wellness providers, counseled thousands of workers, consulted to employers and service providers, published hundreds of articles and been quoted in the press thousands of times. Let me introduce our poll for today's session. Please respond with your, your experience with health savings account. Please select all that have applied. If you've never heard of them, enrolled it, you've been enrolled in, in HSA coverage, you've opened an HSA account, contributed, and have you invested assets? If you haven't yet, please respond. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close and share. All right, so it looks like everyone on here has enrolled in an HSA option. If everyone has contributed to an HSA, some said they haven't opened an HSA account or invested in assets. So that gives us a sense of where people are. I will let Wes tell us a little more about humaculture and how it's important in today's topic. Thanks, Steve. Uh, in each of our webinars, we emphasize a different aspect of the humaculture philosophy and approach. Humaculture is a dynamic paradigm uh, which we have developed to understand, form, and optimize organizations and provide a holistic framework in which to make all decisions. Humaculture borrows many of its insights from the field of horticulture. Horticulture provides a keen metaphor to understand the organization and its, uh, its purpose to attract, engage, grow, retain, sustain, and transition the people who interact with it. A good horticulturist understands that success and sustainability of any garden or landscape is dependent upon balancing several things, 
first the climate and our terrain where the garden is built, the soil uh, structure itself, what type of soil there is or you want to build, the, the availability and sp of space and fertility of the soil, the arrangement and variety of the plantings, the specific plants and their characteristics, the conditions that optimize the availability and absorption of the nutrients from the soil, and finally, the, the desired harvest or value that's to be derived from the garden or landscape. And each of these dimensions dynamically influences all of the others. Similarly, humaculture is the art and philosophy of creating profitable, healthy organizations conceptualized as soil in which people can thrive. Humaculture forms the basis for a systematic approach then to making all decisions of a business or organization within the context of these seven dimensions of humaculture. Our webinar today is focused on strategic responses to an aspect of one of the seven dimensions, people. The humaculture philosophy is something that guides all of our work, even when engaged selectively on narrowly focused aspects of an organization, such as again today, the employees or the people, and how to assure that they have access to the, to the nutrients or rewards that will improve their resiliency. We always help organizations understand how any aspect of our work can be understood in the broader context of the seven dimensions of humaculture. <clears throat> so merely complying with the No Surprises Act and the transparency rules is expected to only increase costs for both employer and employee. In our last webinar, we discussed how a strategic response to compliance and requirements can create a competitive advantage, result in savings for the employer and employees, and potentially increase consumerism and employee health. Today, we're focused on preserving that harvest of savings the increased productivity and the health that come from that strategic response. HSAs are an example of how we can preserve the harvest by financing current expenses on a tax favored basis, but also creating a vehicle to accumulate assets for future needs. HSA eligible plans and health savings accounts when done right, represent a strategic response that can help even fragile employees make the transition from fragile to resilient by again, using these tax preferences to finance what you, know, you can or shouldn't avoid uh, as well as save for the future and use design levers in the design of the plan uh, to influence participant behavior and therefore cost, but also create distinctive plan designs that can attract and retain the talent that the organization desires and needs. Uh, when coupled with the features, the so we couple with the features of the No Surprises Act and the transparency and coverage rules, those that are designed to uh, increase uh, transparency and as far as price and other things, HSA eligible plans and HSAs done right are powerful uh, examples of strategic responses that can preserve your organization's soil fertility and attract and retain those employees again that want to take care of their health, that want to engage in the decision-making process for themselves and for the business, uh, and also be financially responsible responsible with their uh, resources as well as the businesses or organizations. Uh, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about why we believe these rules are likely to be only inflationary through mere compliance? Absolutely. We addressed this as well in our last webinar, but it's important to understand how the No Surprises Act and transparency and coverage rules is likely to increase costs. While you and your service providers may be working on achieving compliance with the No Surprises Act, we believe that basic compliance will add to the cost of coverage through increased employer paid medical expenses by paying out of network services on an in-network basis, medical cost inflation by prompting both in and out of network providers to increase charges and provide more services and increase employee paid expenses through cost shifting. Again, we believe that a strategic response is critical and offers value to both the plan sponsor and the participants. So yes, just like health reform 10 years ago, new compliance requirements such as the No Surprises Act are likely to add to healthcare cost inflation. 
as this graph indicates, we have seen constant unrelenting inflation despite laws designed to bend the curve, which it did, just not in the desired direction. If we extend the graph, this, this graph, the slope of that line will probably become even steeper because the No Surprises Act cost will add yet another layer of expense. Notice the acceleration of inflation around 2014. Just when, the mo just when most of the provisions of the ACA were becoming effective. That result occurred in part because many, perhaps most employers, decided on a compliance only response. Employees have mostly been insulated from health cost inflation. Deductibles and out-of-pocket limits have not kept up with health cost increases. This has deprived employees of opportunities to benefit from savings that result from better health, better health care resulting from better decisions, and better management of their health care costs. Employees' out-of-pocket medical expenses have actually declined from about one-third of all medical costs in the U.S. in 1970 to about 10% today. Many Americans overinsure because they are unprepared for out-of-pocket medical expenses. Many others overinsure because they equate higher coverage and lower deductibles, even though contributions are higher, with better coverage. Today, the average deductible for large employer health plans is about $1,400, which is much lower than what the deductible would have been, perhaps $4,100, had it been indexed for inflation. This leaves a lot of room to increase cost sharing, empowering and better engaging participants in their health and healthcare purchasing. It will also facilitate lower employee fixed costs and deposits into an HSA. Kelly, do you wanna talk a little bit about the impact this has on the workforce and what to do, what to do about it? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Um, you know, it's it's no secret that many people are what we would call financially fragile, and this obviously leads to broader issues in the workplace and our society at large. So creating that strategic response is a great way to include tactics that can encourage and enable employees to become more financially resilient. Um, so some of the symptoms that we see of this financial fragility would include this the oft-quoted survey that shows that over a third of Americans are actually unable to cover a four hundred dollar unexpected bill with cash or other assets and I, I think we should just distinguish here that this isn't just surprise bills that they didn't of things they thought should be covered but just like an unexpected but should be expected bill from their their care and only 25 percent of Americans actually have sufficient savings to cover that rule of thumb of six months of expenses as an emergency fund so when we add in the COVID-19 business closures and volatility with working hours that has disproportionately affected those folks who are probably already financially fragile the problem could actually continue to get worse as inflation continues to rise and as these rules are implemented so um, while today we're, we are focusing on health savings accounts as a way to help reverse that trend of financial fragility, I do want to emphasize that this is just one tool that we see as part of the bigger strategic shift that employers can take in their approach to rewards in a way that looks at more kind of fertilizing the soil for a better overall health of the plants, you know, the employees, and their harvest, both the harvest of the business and the employees. So we see that hidden opportunity with the No Surprises Act and transparency rules that's kind of twofold. So we have this uh, new, the new rules and regulations are an excuse to make a strategic shift. You know, we can kind of blame it on the compliance. And then there's the fact that the new rules and regulations contain provisions that actually enable more effective use of tools like um, reference-based pricing, which was our first webinar. There's the consumer-oriented health plans um, that encourage participants to be more literate with healthcare decisions and how those costs are allocated. And of course, the tax-favored spending and savings features of HSAs. So we know that there's not like a silver bullet here that's going to magically make all employees financially resilient, but we do think that HSA enabled plans and then encouraging best practices with usage of those can be a big part of a greater shift towards enabling and empowering your people through helping them to preserve the harvest through their own savings and budgeting along with allowing them to build up their longer term resilience through the ongoing savings, investing, and ultimately retirement preparation that's offered through these accounts. 
So bigger picture, there is an opportunity here to review all the resources that you're making available um, to support financial resilience for your employees through the lens of cultivating the soil versus just kind of spraying pesticide on the problem. What I mean is when it comes to your rewards programs as a whole, think about are your rewards geared more towards entitlement or are they geared towards opportunity and empowerment? I think, you, you know, we've had this culture of, you know, entitling people and making them feel protected, but shifting it to opportunity and empowerment is the hidden opportunity here. So there's an entitlement focused rewards often provide more than most employees really need, while also promoting kind of a culture of dependence. They expect to have these robust benefits, even if they don't need them. Um, while empowerment focused rewards like the HSA enabled healthcare options will promote a culture of innovation, creativity, self responsibility. This helps to attract and retain a workforce that has those characteristics and is less uh, has a less of expect of an expectation of being kind of protected, but they value the opportunity to make their own empowered choices for their unique situation. So again, the, the important hidden opportunity here could be to consider all of the, your rewards in view of whether they contribute to a protection from financial fragility or a fostering of financial resilience. And so that said, um, Despite the fact that HSAs have been around for almost 20 years now, a minority of Americans actually own one. <laughs> I know a lot of people here in the poll have them, but maybe that's you know why we're here to learn more about it. But part of that is due to the, just the simple fact that HSA eligible coverage is not available through Medicare, Medicaid, VA benefits. That's where a significant number of Americans actually obtain their health care coverage. But beyond that, these types of health care plans still aren't offered by a majority of employers which means most people haven't even had the opportunity to take advantage of this, even though it truly offers the most valuable, lucrative tax preferences of any benefit program out there. Um, and, you know, the fact is that one of the things that I think holds employers and, and even employees back from adopting these is this perception that this high deductible plan is the problem. But HSA eligible plans actually can have a, an individual deductible as low as $1,400, which I think this gets lost in the weeds because of this whole high deductible healthcare plan nomenclature. As Steve said, a $1,400 deductible is actually on par with the average on all plans, but it's actually less than Medicare deductibles and it's much less than that $4,100 amount that we previously mentioned, um, which is what it would have been had we kept healthcare costs and in index for inflation or at least deductibles. So there's just so much opportunity here. And I'm gonna send it over to Jack to talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, Kelly. So as we said in the last month's presentation, reference-based pricing and health savings accounts, coupled with consumer-oriented health coverage, are great examples of strategic responses to the No Surprises Act and the transparency rule requirements. Again, if you take nothing else away from these sessions, remember to apply Yogi Berra's famous words, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. That is, if you only take the path to compliance, you may be adding rocks or weeds to your soil that will not be particularly helpful or improve workers' perception of your health plan. As we discussed last month, the No Surprises Act is a response to perceived widespread unexpected or surprise medical bills. But if you choose merely to comply with the new rules, how surprised and disappointed will your employees be once they find that full compliance with the No Surprises Act increases, not reduces their costs in their contributions and over time and, and, and in their point of purchase cost sharing. Again, as we discussed in our last webinar, the No Surprises Act only addresses a small portion of unexpected medical bills. Preparing for out-of-pocket expenses may not be that great of a challenge. And that's because 1% of all Americans, shown in the graph here, account for 22% of all healthcare spending, and 10% account for more than two thirds of all spending. Moreover, medical spending is concentrated among older Americans and those with chronic conditions or disabilities, and that's generally not active workers. As mentioned earlier, the average out-of-pocket spend is about $1,240 per person per year. But for comparison, the median or the middle level of out-of-pocket spending for Americans is less than 500 bucks a year. So even if the No Surprises Act is successful, 
workers who are unprepared will still be surprised by what are really just unexpected medical bills. The No Surprises Act and the transparency rules include some hidden opportunities that will prompt some plan sponsors to introduce or reintroduce consumerism. The goal is to help employees become better decision makers, which means that they'll be better equipped in the workplace and to improve other areas, decision making in other areas of their lives. The mandated disclosures will make more cost information available, which should help in decision making, potentially leading to greater competition and lower costs. The Employee Benefits Research Institute studies show people are much more judicious in spending their own money and in utilization of healthcare services when their own account balance is at risk. EBRI studies also show that people with HSA accounts don't deny themselves needed care. In fact, as HSA account balances increase, they may blunt the effect of ever-increasing cost sharing. HSAs coupled with consumer-oriented health coverage are a hidden opportunity and an excellent strategic response to the No Surprises Act and the Transparency and Coverage Rules. HSAs have failed to gain traction, as Kelly mentioned before, because they're seldom done right. They're typically offered as a choice, as an option against an HMO or a traditional PPO, but most times the HSA eligible coverage is not strategically positioned. Done right, HSAs will attract and retain employees who are interested in making material contributions to the organization, understand the opportunity a health savings account offers, recognize that the deductible for HSA eligible coverage is manageable, and are pretty much focused on uh, trying to achieve and maintain good health. And done right, your HSA designs can serve as a sentinel, dissuading those who see the deductible as significant, anticipate significant medical expenses, and prioritize lucrative medical coverage. The strategic goal is to help employees become better decision makers, be more fiscally responsible, more financially resilient, and responsible for their health is a means to minimize expense and maximize savings and accumulated assets. The next two slides compare HSAs with two other more prevalent tax preferred benefits. First, health FSAs is shown here, and next, 401ks. In many ways, the HSA is superior to both, but the thing to remember is that the best outcome for you and your employees likely requires plan designs and administration that coordinate the use of all three. HSAs do have many advantages over FSAs. The differences here are highlighted in green and red, with green, of course, being the more favorable provisions. HSAs are clearly superior. There's no use or lose, carryover is unlimited, you can invest the assets, they grow tax deferred, and they're ultimately received tax-free most of the time. Assets are always fully vested, they're always portable, and while HSAs deliver the greatest value when you use them for qualifying medical expenses, they're not limited to medical expenses. Doing HSAs right would lead plan sponsors to strategically favor the use of HSAs in a manner that leverages these advantages before FSAs. HSAs also have some advantages over 401k plans. Here's that comparison. There are some places where the K plan is superior in terms of loans and contribution limits, catch-up eligibility and amounts, and the 10% penalty tax. But for retirement purposes, the HSA continues to be superior because of the additional tax preferences in contributions and in payouts. Doing HSAs right would lead plan sponsors to position HSAs as a savings vehicle, highlighting the triple tax advantage rather than positioning it as limited to medical spend, like a super health FSA. Steve? Thanks, Jack. In each of our webinars in this series, we will be sharing some insights into how to use behaviorally designed communications to help lead employees to better decisions. Effective behaviorally designed communications will lead employees, customers, shareholders, and others 
to make the best use of the fertile soil of your organization. Let's consider some aspects of effective behavioral, behaviorally designed communications. Here are a few examples of heuristics from our library that can, be, that can apply to your communications. To introduce change as prompted by the No Surprises Act to appeal to talent that will advance the organization's strategy. Use redesign, ordering, creative names, et cetera, to guide participants toward options that empower people to better decision makers. Based on a study I conducted, these basic principles can be used to shift elections by 30 percentage points or more. To help employees take ownership of their health, be fiscally responsible, and, pre and present HSA savings as a way to prepare for the expected and unexpected expenses. Deploy tactics proven to be successful in 401k plans to encourage participation, savings, and financial resilience. It's time to educate, prepare, and encourage employees to become better decision makers, as well as be fiscally responsible for their own and corporate resources and take ownership of their health before they become patients. Our goal with our strategic compliance series is to help you understand why it is important to go beyond basic compliance. In our first two webinars, we've offered a couple of suggestions on, strate on strategies that respond to the No Surprises Act and transparency and coverage rules. Reference-based pricing is an example for how to avoid aspects of compliance while also reducing plan costs. Leveraging HSAs is an example of how rewards can be used to avoid taxes, appeal to the talent, that is competent in making good decisions, fiscally responsible, and interested in taking ownership of their health. We think both can help plan sponsors cultivate a competitive advantage while also preserving the harvest uh, through the savings and impact on productivity and health. It is also important to note that an advisor whose income is tied to a percentage of healthcare costs may be hesitant to help you with some of these more strategic course changes that can actually reduce costs. We'll cover this in greater detail in our fifth webinar in May. We've developed a compliance toolkit, but we think mere compliance is, isn't enough. Our hemoculturists can help you comply, or we can help you comply and offer approaches that may enhance your participant experience and health coverage without increasing participant or plan costs. A dual approach will ensure you minimize the compliance challenge as well as create competitive advantages to attract and retain the talent you seek and make the organization fiscally more, financially more competitive. As we've said, the requirements of basic compliance is not the focus of this webinar series, but we have developed some great resources to support your basic compliance needs. These are available on our website and we'll distribute this presentation and these are links that will allow you to get to each of these resources. Our future sessions will expand on our first two webinars in this series and we'll provide other illustrative examples of strategies you can employ to leverage the hidden opportunities to be found in the No Surprise Act and the Transparency and Coverage Rules. We want to help you better manage your benefit programs and differentiate your employee value proposition to attract and support the talent that is that will best advance your company's business objectives. Next month, Scott McKibben will be joining us as we explore potential strategies related to pharmacy benefits. All right, now we'll take a few questions. As we said at the beginning, follow up, we will follow up. Uh, with a written Q&A to be distributed to all participants in today's session. Let me just look at our questions here. All right, so our first question, we have a large population of employees with ongoing prescriptions for chronic conditions, so the first dollar coverage is a barrier to adoption of HSA-eligible plans. 
any tips there? Kelly, can I have you answer that? Sure, Steve, thanks. I've I've seen this uh, firsthand in especially um, large manufacturing organizations. And, you know, you, uh, Jack mentioned the average uh, out-of-pocket actually being close to $500. So there's a best practice of just funding those first $500 dollars with a employer contribution as an incentive to, to opt into this. But for folks who feel that that still might be enough, there's actually um, another plan design option that could um, help with some of the more common preventive medications, which would allow them to be covered 100% uh, first dollar and still be compliant with the HSA eligibility rules. And that really overcome a lot of objections for people that take like blood pressure medication, insulin, any of those kind of preventive care medicines. So um, there's a deeper conversation there around how that would all be positioned and obviously the compliance with the rules, but there it's not an impossible obstacle to overcome even in populations that have uh, strong usage of preventive care meds. All right, uh, let me ask one more. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, you mentioned transition features when adding HSA eligible coverage. Can you provide some examples, Jeff? That might be sure. Good for you. Yeah, so one example, uh, again, as I mentioned before, most employees offer HSA eligible coverage as an option, a choice. If you if you do that, you're going to want to think about leveling the playing field so that employees can easily compare the coverage options. For example, when you offer a traditional PPO alongside the HSA eligible option, a savvy plan sponsor will change the traditional PPO's deductible so it operates the same way, applies the same way as the deductible for HSA eligible coverage. Thanks. I'm going to just add one other point to that is this, this was actually one of the focuses of some of the research that I did. I, I also think that the way you name and order the plans has a big impact uh, and even how you, the coloring you use in the setup and how you set up the decision tree for employees and what tools you're providing to help them make decisions. Like if you're going to call it a high deductible plan, that's going to scare a lot of people away from it. So there's a lot we can do from a design perspective and the communications perspective as well. But I think that's all the time we have today. So thank you for joining us. We hope you find this helpful. We would love to hear from you, to learn more from you about your specific challenges or circumstances. Please remember to register for our remaining sessions and complete the survey uh, you will receive following the session. We really value your feedback and it will have help us prepare for our future sessions and adapt uh, to make these even more valuable in the future. Thank you very much and have a great day.